Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. I'm Matt, a police officer from Iowa. As a seasoned police officer, I've led numerous search and rescue missions, but this one would etch itself into my memory forever. It all started when a hiker was reported missing in the vast wilderness that borders our town. The search team I led was combing through the dense underbrush when one of my officers stumbled upon a smartphone half buried under a pile of leaves. The battery was nearly dead, but once charged, it revealed a series of photos and videos that sent chills down our spines. The lost hiker had captured images of the surrounding woods, but it was the videos that were truly unsettling. They showed shaky footage of what appeared to be a massive, hairy figure moving between the trees, resembling the legendary Sasquatch. The final video was a frantic, whispered plea for help, with a figure looming in the background. Skeptical but intrigued, we employed every modern technology at our disposal. Drones equipped with thermal imaging flew over the forest, while officers on the ground used GPs tracking to map out a strategy. Our efforts led us to a hidden network of caves, previously undocumented and perfectly concealed by the natural landscape. Inside, we found a man who looked as though he had stepped out of time itself. His beard was long and unkempt, his clothes tattered and faded. He was the survivalist long thought to have perished in these woods. With a mixture of relief and bewilderment, he recounted his tale of chasing after what he believed was a Sasquatch, only to get hopelessly lost. The caves had become his refuge, his home away from civilization. His story was met with skepticism. We had no evidence of Sasquatch's existence, only the ramblings of a man who had spent too much time in isolation. We helped him back to civilization, promising to keep an eye on the area, but privately doubting we'd find anything more. The following day, I decided to patrol the area myself. The woods were eerily silent, the only sound my own footsteps crunching on the forest floor. I was about to turn back, convinced there was nothing to find, when a movement caught my eye. Standing there in a clearing bathed in the soft light of the setting sun was the unmistakable figure of what could only be described as a Sasquatch. It was massive, covered in thick, dark fur, and it stared right at me with a deep, intelligent gaze before disappearing into the woods. In that moment, all skepticism vanished. The reality of what I had seen struck me with a force that left me reeling. I stood there for what felt like hours, trying to comprehend the encounter. I had always believed in what I could see, touch, and explain. But here, in the heart of the wilderness, I was faced with a mystery that defied all logic. The search for the missing hiker eventually concluded with their safe return, but the experience left a lasting impression on me. The world is full of mysteries some hidden deep within the shadows of our planet's oldest forest. As for the survivalist, he became a source of invaluable knowledge about living off the grid, though he never stopped believing, or searching, for the creature that led him astray. As for me, I patrol the woods with a new sense of wonder and respect, ever mindful of the mysteries that dwell just beyond the veil of our understanding. The image of the Sasquatch etched into my memory serves as a reminder of the endless possibilities that exist in the unexplored corners of the world. It was September 18. My dad's friend had a dogman that killed his dog. He was a 130-pound dog, and his wife's uncle gave her that dog. Before he had passed, and she promised him that she would take care of it. The dog one night knew something was out there, so he was just barking like crazy. He had gotten out, and the next morning, and they found the dog dead on their porch with the guts ripped out. Justin put the dog somewhere else, and when he came to get the dog because he was going to bury it, but when he got there, the dog was gone. He checked his trail camera and he saw the dogman. He had pictures, but I did not have the pictures of the dogman. His wife was very upset. (laughs) 
One morning, around 6 a.m., about two years ago, I was living not far from Washington, D.C. A friend of a friend needed a roommate to afford the rent for an apartment he had found. So when I was told about this, my first thought was, oh yeah, here's my chance to move out of my parents' house. After about six months of living in the area, I noticed that on certain nights, I would hear loud roars in the distance. I could never tell how far away the noise was coming from. It would sometimes sound nearby or just far enough away where I wouldn't mind being outside to see what it might be making the sound from a safe distance. I lived in a quiet, wooded area. A lot of people lived in the area. I actually lived within five minutes walking distance away from the University of Maryland. One morning around 6 a.m., I just snapped awake from a deep, sound sleep for no reason at all. I started to go back to sleep but thought to myself, why am I wide awake and alert? It was strange. I was completely awake. Then, right in my backyard, I heard a low, deep growl. That's when I knew something was up. The moment I heard that, I knew. That was why I woke up. I remained quiet and didn't move for the next five to ten minutes, as this thing started to become very active in my backyard. It went from the low growls to heavy breathing. This thing's lungs had to be massive because it sounded the same exact way a horse would if you were standing right next to it. When it breathed through its nose, it sounded more like a horse. But this thing sounded like it was aggressive. I knew it wasn't a horse in the backyard. That wouldn't be possible, but what I saw was very real. It literally ran from my backyard into the dividing fence of my backyard from my neighbor's backyard again and again. It made no sense for it to be doing that. It would often stop and sniff around and sneeze very loudly. It sounded like it was right next to my window and I was on the second floor. I didn't want to look out the window because I thought that there is no way in the world no one else is hearing this right now but me. I thought this thing is trying to get my attention on purpose. I stayed still in bed without moving and I was beyond scared. I really thought it was a werewolf, even before I saw it. I always thought that they were real. The guys that lived below me started yelling and screaming, El Diablo! Over and over again they yelled that. I could hear the thing leaving the backyard, so I hurried to try and get a look at it. When I did, all I saw was its backside. This thing was massive, with broad shoulders like a bodybuilder, and it had ears sticking up on its head. It slowly walked away until I lost sight of it. When I was in high school, my friends and I would walk to a local 24-7 cafe about two miles away from my house at all hours of the night. Sometimes we would walk down the street. Other times we would cut through the woods. We would always be in groups of at least four, so it was never intimidating or creepy until one night when we decided to cut through the woods. We were about 20 feet away from exiting the trail and onto the road when there was a bright flash, followed by a high-pitched ringing similar to an old Polaroid camera. I was staring at the ground when it happened, and from the angle of my shadow, I could tell it came from above and behind us. There were about five of us, and we all took a few more steps before one of my buddies said, Did anyone else see that? And right after he said, that we heard a man coughing from a tree behind us. Needless to say, we all hauled ass to the cafe and took the roads back home. This was in 2003. We were in a helicopter on a rescue mission. We were going to land in this valley right next to a large mountain around 4,200 meters high. There was intelligence that the enemy was hiding out there. So naturally, they were our targets for being seen by us. When we got very close to the landing zone, this 200 meter long cavern opened up under the helicopter's path. I was a gunner at the time, so I was one of the first ones to see this. It looked like a black hole, and it happened so fast that we could have been hit by accident if we weren't careful about our surroundings. Luckily, none of us died from it. There were supposed to be five enemy combatants in this cavern with their wives and kids. 
These things were anywhere between seven to nine feet tall and certainly not enemy soldiers. They had greenish yellow scaly skin, huge fangs, long claws, and looked like damn abominations from a Frankenstein monster. They also had webbed hands and claws. Our pilots saw this coming. We used our searchlights and lit up the cavern nicely before landing. They were pretty upset or so they seemed and, and immediately began chasing after the copter. The pilot tried taking off again and we began shooting at these things. They screamed like demons, wanted to take down our chopper and with all the gunfire going on, the helicopter began to spin out of control, nearly crashing. We had to battle these things for a good while but we were finally able to kill them all using a combination of ammo and grenades. We lost several good men. We had to retreat on the mission to escape what was going on here. We were able to get a hold of a company, and a chopper came in for us about three hours later because we hid. We managed to stay alive. I don't know exactly how we managed to survive this, but we did, and it wasn't because of me so much as the other guys on my squad. They were the true heroes, to be sure. I just wanted to do my duty and help. This is what happened during the battle, though. It turns out that these things were an ancient breed of mutated humans who lived in the mountains long ago. There are reports of them being worshipped by ancient cults. This is what I've been told by other fellow veterans who have had their own stories with these creatures as well. During this time in Afghanistan, there are even men during Desert Storm that talk about large humanoid beings who hide under the sand and who have attacked and devoured convoys whole. Pretty terrifying stuff out there in the desert. My uncle is a commercial fisherman and I have gone out with him to do a few squid seasons. You fish at night in total darkness and use lights to get the squid to come up and mate so you can swoop them up. Multiple times big animals came to the surface and took out hundreds of pounds of the catch and every damn time it scared the hell out of me. Most of the time it's sperm whales. But there was one time we both saw what we thought was like a bright spotted orange or red giant jellyfish looking thing go over a group of them like a net and just made them disappear before diving back down. It freaked my uncle out so much, guy's been fishing for 45 plus years now, that he called all the other boats and tells the story all the time now. He's convinced we saw a new species of sea creature. I was driving home from work on Route 66 near the Green Gauge Mall around 9 p.m. when my headlights suddenly picked up a large canid-looking creature darting across the road. As it reached the side of the road, it swiftly dropped to all fours and skillfully crawled under a fence that encircled a power transformer. I couldn't believe my eyes. This creature had a snout like a dog and was completely covered in hair. My curiosity got the better of me, so I decided to pull over, grabbed my trusty flashlight, and cautiously made my way around the fence site. To my surprise, I discovered a dugout area that was about two feet deep, right at the fence's edge. I would have been around 12, 13 at the time, and on a deep-sea fishing trip with a family group, Somebody spotted what looked like a body floating about 70 feet or so from the boat. It was pretty indistinct at that distance, but it was fleshy colored and large enough to be an adult human. I could also see what looked like a couple of rib bones sticking out of it. We pointed it out to the skipper who checked it out with his binoculars and claimed it was a dead seal. He then stashed the binoculars back in the wheelhouse and refused to let anyone else take a look through them. The skipper went a bit quiet after that, and the body gradually floated away from us and out of sight, and we thought no more of it until later when we were on our way back in at the end of the day. The skipper out of nowhere started telling us about the time he found the body of a young woman at sea, 
He had taken out a group of mentally handicapped kids for a boat trip when he found her. He recovered the body by netting it and tying it to the side of the boat before heading in. This completely freaked the kids out on the boat, and he said he found the whole experience to be deeply traumatic. To make things worse, he was accused by the girl's family of stealing a bracelet from the body and ended up being questioned by the police. It turned out that the bracelet was there all along, but just not immediately visible because of how bloated the body had become. He finished by telling us that if he ever found another body at sea, he would leave it where it was. I have always wondered exactly what he saw through those binoculars. I have a very strange walking trail encounter with an invisible two-legged very large thing while walking with my dog. Some of the trail sections have wooded areas alongside of the walking paths, so most of the trail has woods on one side of the path and the park is on the other side of the trail. The wooded area is not very large, I would guess about 300 feet by half a mile, so I don't consider it a forest, I just call it the woods. The wooded area of the park has three or four small creeks, and I think only one of the creeks has some water. Most of the trees are beautiful, and normal tall trees, and some of the trees here and there look like they're dead. There's always people and kids going down there to ride bikes, hang out, and whatever else they do. One day around 4 p.m., I took my female dog, Bertha, for our normal everyday walk. We had just gotten off the car and began our walk. We were probably walking on the trail for about five minutes or so when I started feeling weird after a turn. No, not scared or afraid. I started to feel happy and my little pain aches had disappeared. This was very strange because I remember saying to myself inside my head, not out loud, I said, wow, I feel good. I feel like a little kid. I feel brand new. It was only about 20 seconds of this young and joyful feeling when all of a sudden something had let go of a large bush that it was holding on to. The thing sounded like it was intertwined in the bush, like holding on and trying to hide. At the same time of the noise in the bush, Bertha turned towards the bush and started going after it. I had Bertha on a leash and she was dragging me, almost taking me into the woods. I had to hold her back because I couldn't see what was making all that noise. It moved through another tall bush and started stepping heavy with loud thumps. I think it fell when it made it out of the bush area. The thing was only about 15 feet away from us on the other side of the bushes and sounded like two very large horses stomping on the ground. I could see the bushes and the grass moving, but I could not see anything. We moved back away from the trail a few feet so I can see a clearing on the other side of the bushes to try to see this thing. I looked right where the sounds of steps were coming from and saw nothing. So I looked down on the ground and I could see where two feet were stepping on the tall grass. I remember I said to myself in my head, no way that is not an invisible monster. After I said that I heard something, I will never forget. The thing started making loud T-Rex stomps. Then I said out loud, That sounds like T-Rex. From the movies, I recall, I could feel the stomps on the ground. Bertha and I were just looking into the woods at this sound. I can feel my eardrums shaking bad, and both eardrums felt like busted speakers. In my head, I said, It's trying to blow my eardrum. The T-Rex stomps lasted about 10 or 15 seconds. Then the sound stopped it, just turned off like a light switch. I have no idea if it jumped into something or it vanished. It is strange because after all that I still felt happy with no worry or fear at all. Just very curious. I really wanted to see it. On the way home, I remember thinking. Any other day, I would have been afraid and ran away from it. I heard this thing three or four times in the following days. In another section of woods, I could hear someone heavy walking on leaves just inside the tree line about 30 feet away in the woods, alongside me in Bertha. I would hear it, and I would stop without turning to it. And it would take a step or two, and it would stop. I turned around a few times to see nothing because it wasn't moving. 
I did this a few times to make sure. I would tell myself in my head, if a person stays on trail, they have no permission to take you. I think one time I heard his steps in the woods next to me. I said to myself in my head, I think it wants me to make a mistake and go into the woods towards it. After I said that I never heard it again, I'm sure it can hear what I'm thinking. Just a few weeks ago, I'd seen something very strange related to this thing. Bertha and I were walking in the same part of the trail, only about 100 feet away from my first encounter where the bushes were. I stopped to look into the woods at this view into the woods. I was standing still looking past the trees, how the area was covered in a few inches of light green grass. I was looking kinda downhill how the woods go down in and around the creek down there. I said to myself, it looks beautiful. The trees, the color of greens, and the sunlight and shadow. It looks like a postcard, perfect, about two or three seconds after I thought that. While I was just looking down at this area of woods, I saw a big human-shaped blur move between two trees about 80 feet away. I saw it for a split second. It was big, maybe 10 feet tall. Big head, big wide muscle shoulders, and I remember his big left leg. I remember his left knee and big muscle above it, the laterals. I could see the thick, shiny hair on the leg. Yes, this thing looked exactly like the predator from the movie when he is cloaked. It is very weird how my brain was able to capture this image. My memory surprised me. His shoulders, his head, and the side of his back was reflecting the woods between him and me. It looked like a male, not a female. I was surprised just like him. In my opinion, uh, I think he took off running because he thought I was sensing that he was in the area. But I had no idea he was there. I think he knows Bertha. Can't pick up on him if he hides a little farther away from the trail. I am very cautious when we go walking near woods now. I also tell people where I'm going and carry a few extra things hidden on me. I have no idea why this thing got so close to me or what its intentions were. And I also don't know why it ran away from me those times. Was there something or someone behind me that startled it? These occurrences were a very incredible time of my life. It changed me in a good way. I often think I don't know, but maybe that's why dogs are on this planet to help us and pick up on these invisible things when they get to close. Always be happy and do the things you love doing in your life. Have no worries and certainly no fear. I hope my story helps people to be alert and careful out there in this world. In June of 2006, four of us were on a training mission north of Camp Lejeune near the town of Jacksonville. We pulled off next to a field and all went down into the field, laid around for about an hour after taking in the sun. Being out in the brush for most of the morning, there was nothing but woods as far as you could see, even behind us. No traffic, no sounds of really any kind. We didn't think too much about it since we were taking a break. There was a rise in the field that I had to stand up to look over. As soon as I stood up, I saw what looked like two black things laying down on the edge of the wood line about 200 yards away. As soon as they saw me, they stood up and they started walking off at a brisk pace. I immediately drew my moor carbine and told everybody else to stay low. I fired off one round towards them at their feet, which is what I was taught to do if you were trying to get somebody's attention. The two subjects immediately began sprinting towards the woods, which only made me now more nervous. I was taught that you don't run from somebody trying to contact you. After they disappeared, I told everybody else to stand up. We all took off for our vehicles. We didn't say much after until we got back to base. The next day, we got together and talked about what had happened. We agreed that the subjects were both male and they were both around 5, 8 to 6 feet tall. They ran like track athletes or soldiers, not like lumbering large people who are overweight. One of the guys on our team was a good shot. We all decided that he would be the one who would shoot the subject if we ever ran into them again. He's six, two, around 215 pounds, and in good shape. The next time we went on a training mission, 
There were only four of us instead of five, so somebody stayed behind for some reason. We were out there for almost three days. We got back to camp on a Friday night, and everybody was eager to get home for the weekend. On Saturday, we all went down into town to eat. I didn't say much about what had happened, just that I felt uneasy being out there alone without a team. One of the guys on our team, let's call him Sam, was really freaked out by it and did not want to ever go back into that field again. He told me he heard moaning sounds coming from the woods while we were out there. When I asked him if he thought they could have been animals, he said no, that it was too loud and sounded like it came from two different people. I didn't really know what to say since I had only heard the sounds once, when I stood up quickly but never when lying down in the grass like we had. I had no idea he had heard them. Sam was convinced that there were people out there. He wanted me to tell a team leader about it. I told him that I would tell him about it the next time we went out on a training mission. He was really scared, so he wanted to go back and investigate further with me. I informed him no. About a week later, we were all at the team leader's house waiting for him to get home from work, and I told him about what had happened. They laughed at first, but none of them had heard the moaning sounds or seen anything on their patrols. The team leader, let's call him Rich, told us that he did not want us to come back out there without a full team of people just in case it was true. I agreed with him and was glad that he felt that way. I can see that so far nothing has happened yet, but I'll let you know as soon as we do. Last note, I believe the two figures we saw were juvenile or adolescent Sasquatch, seemingly caught off guard. I've never encountered a Wendigo, but when I was staying out in Arizona with a friend, I heard some very, very strange sounds in the desert. My friend couldn't hear them, but I clearly heard what sounded like a child crying or squealing. I went out to the back patio of the trailer we were in and listened hard, and it creeped me out infinitely when I could still hear the sounds. Exactly the same, never changing pitch or cadence. My friend, even standing right where my feet were planted, still could not hear the sounds. I thought I was going nuts. The next day, I related my experience to Gary, an older relative of my friend who related to me an encounter. He had almost 30 years before that day. Gary told me about how he lived on the outskirts of a reservation where people had gone missing in alarming amounts. No mass disappearances at one time, but a steady increase in missing persons, reports that left tribal law enforcement and local law enforcement at odds with one another and very suspicious that a serial killer may be on the loose. During a joint investigation, both law agencies went house to house interviewing residents close to where most of the people were last seen, asking them what kind of information they could provide. When they got to where Gary was staying, they were asking questions about strange sounds and sighting in the mountainous area directly next to the reservation. Gary thought it was odd, but informed them that once in a while, he'd hear a child crying out near the entrance to the mountain trail and go out in his truck looking to see if anyone was lost. He never saw any people, but noted that the usually buzzing surroundings were so still that it unnerved him. One night in particular, Gary said he saw what looked like six stag in the woods not far up the path leading to the start of the mountain trail. He said it was pale with visible antlers and it looked like it was laying down on its front hooves and struggling to get up. Gary explained that he stepped out of his truck with his flashlight, turned to grab his rifle, and by the time he looked back up the trail, the stag was gone. It was at this point where a stench so foul overtook him that his eyes stung and he involuntarily gagged and had to hold back his dinner. He described it as an earthy, sticky, palpable musk smell that had a sweet after stench to it. He also said it smelled like rotted meat and copper. He was immediately beset with a feeling of mortal dread and had to contain his panic as he jumped back into his truck. He said as he was backing up to leave the narrow trail, he heard clear as day, almost as if it was right in the truck with him, a child's cry. 
Only this close, I sounded more like a powerful whale that was impossible for a child to emit. He hightailed it out of there and was in the process of looking for a new place to live. He said he had trouble sleeping for a while after that night due to constant nightmares of things banging on his windows. After he told the police this account, he said the two officers looked at one another, shared some kind of non-verbal interaction, thanked him for his time, and asked him to call the station instantly if he heard any strange sounds or saw anything. Before they left, he said he asked them how many other people reported seeing or hearing something similar to what he just told them. They responded that at least one person from each house they visited reported hearing children crying in the night, with other residents of the same household claiming to never have heard or seen anything unusual. They also said that at least one other person they interviewed had seen a pale-looking creature on the mountain, which they thought was a big cat of some sort. What impacted Gary the most, though, was when one of the tribal officers told him that, while interviewing the family of a missing person, they related that in the weeks leading up to their child's disappearance, their child had been suffering from nightmares of demon deer. Outside of their window and drew many pictures of what it looked like. Gary asked if they had the pictures, and the officer produced a Polaroid taken of the drawing. It looked almost exactly like what he'd seen that night on the Mount Rail, pale, skinny, big antlers, except this drawing had features he was fortunate to not have seen in person. Huge red eyes, sharp bloody teeth and claws, and a black hole next to it with arms sticking out of it. Gary moved two days after this. After Gary finished telling me that story, he laughed heartily, probably at the horrified expression on my face. He said, don't worry, as long as you don't follow the cries, you will be all right. I've never forgotten that story. I admit that Gary could very well have been pranking me because he was a jokester, but no one else in the home seemed to be amused when he told me the story, and his demeanor was very serious. I believe that he experienced what he related because I heard the cries in the night for myself, clear as crystal, while my friend heard nothing, even while I was actively listening to the wailing of a child crying. I was around nine years old or so and was at my mom's friend's house because they were having a little get-together. My mom's best friend at the time decided to go get something, which was at a house nearby down a dirt road in the woods. My mom's friend decided to take my friend and me with her. I wish I had never gone with her. We rode with her over there, and when she got out, my friend and I stayed in her car and waited for her to come back. After sitting in her car for ten minutes, we decided to get out to see what was taking her so long. When we did that, she told us to get back in the car, so we did. As it turned out, she was buying weed, so we weren't welcome in the house. So my buddy and I got back in her car and waited for her to come out. They had a lot of bulldogs at that property. The dogs had all been barking like crazy and then just stopped all at once and went into their dog houses. That's when my friend and I saw this thing that looked like some kind of werewolf coming from behind the car. We froze and just stared at it as it walked by. Wow, it looked so demonic. When we saw it, we ducked down and laid on the floorboards. We laid there for what seemed like forever until we heard my mom's friend hitting on the driver's window, trying to get us to let her in. I guess it left when it heard her come out of the house or something. I'm a 32-year-old lady from the very northern tip of West Virginia. Most of my life has been lived in Hancock County. When I was little, we camped in tents, walked everywhere, hiked at parks. All that outside goodness. In my teens, we started going to state parks to ride horses. I've been to Thomason Run, Beaver Creek State Park, Salt Fork, Raccoon Creek, and Vista Park. I think that was the name. We had a friend who was constantly inviting us to ride on people's land she had received permission from. I'm well acquainted with the local wildlife. I've seen all the major players, 
including coy dogs and bears, and can identify most sounds in the forest. I love watching nature documentaries. I was looking to become a vet, so I studied a lot on animals. Drawing and painting them got me very acquainted with animal anatomy. Was I ever into cryptozoology? Yes. I was a Dino. Crazy little girl. My one babysitter had readers digest mysteries of the unexplained. The thought of a plesiosaur in Scotland or an apatosaurus in the Congo was just mind-blowing. Later in life, I started looking at it like folklore. It was interesting to read the accounts and learn the theories behind what people were seeing, but I believed in them as much as a folklorist believes in dragons and trolls. I didn't have any interest in Bigfoot, and I'd never heard of Dogman. I never had interest in looking, nor did the thoughts ever cross my mind. It seems I didn't need to go looking. They found me. We moved to the farm when I was about ten. Mom's dream was to have horses, and she was finally able to live it. The farmhouse was haunted mainly by the former residents of the house. I never felt threatened by them, though. It's a little unnerving to have two men talking and moving the couch you're sitting on. Or should I say it sounded like it? No one was home. No media was on. And yet I was hearing two men talking about how they were going to move the couch and where. And the sound of furniture being dragged right from under me. The land itself had its share of strangeness. Most things were benign, though. We just shrugged and carried on. I honestly hated our woods. Anywhere else, I'd freely hike, but even in the yard, sometimes I felt watched. Heck, sometimes I thought something was staring in our windows. Now that I think of it, we did have things slam into our trailer. I'd think it was a horse that had gotten loose. But when I'd go out to investigate, I'd find nothing. I'd chalk it up to a deer. I used my horse's breeds for their names rather than think up names for them. Anyone who knows me knew my horse's names. I was 18 to 19 in this encounter. By this time, we gave up on cows. I hate, hate, hate them, and just had the horses and chickens. Someone knocked on the door at 2 a.m. I'd only been asleep two hours, but years of conditioning had my heart pumping and my mind clearing. Someone knocking that early meant trouble. It usually meant horses or livestock had gotten out. I wasn't disappointed. Our neighbor said the horses were in his yard. My mind wasn't totally awake, so I didn't think to ask which yard they were in. My stepfather came out, asked what was up, and told me they were my horses, so deal with it. Mom was working. That was nothing new. This lot of horses had three expert escape artists. I had the routine down. It was pretty dark out, but I did have some moonlight to help. The security light only went so far. Then, of course, it shut off after so long. When it was cloudy, you literally had to watch that you didn't walk off into the ravine. It was so pitch. I was naturally in a foul mood, cursing my horses and wondering if some drunk had gone through the fence again. It happened a lot. As I got closer to the brown barn, I realized a horse was flipping out. It was running back and forth, squealing and carrying on. I went in and grabbed the halters and leads. I paused for a moment to see if any other horse or horses had replied to the horse I heard squeal. That would give me an idea where the other horse or horses might be. There was no reply. That was odd. I was thinking, crap, they're on the other side of the hill. It was the only reason in my mind they wouldn't be replying. Let's just say, when they followed our cut trails to the other side, it took us an hour to traverse through the woods and lead them back, and even with two guys on a four-wheeler and my mom, that was a freaky treak. I felt like I was being watched and followed. Maybe it wasn't paranoia. So, the land is set up like this. The brown barn was connected to a small pasture, about half an acre long which then connects to a seven-acre pasture. Pretty much in the center, on the outside edge of the large pasture, was an old white barn that we turned into a run-in. I decided to tackle the horse still in the fence so I could bring her down to the small pasture to keep her from escaping too. Maybe the others would follow. 
I had to walk clear to the other side of the pasture to get to the panicking horse. It was my mother's psychoapalooza mare. I tried to catch her and nearly got trampled. A few times trying, she was frothing at the mouth and her eye whites were really showing. Was I alarmed? No. As I said, psycho, I noticed my other six were across the road. They were standing in a tiny little fence, in area under a spotlight. They were standing motionless and not touching a blade of grass. I was wondering how the neighbor managed to herd them into that tiny fenced-in area with that tiny door. Three of those horses were over sixteen hands tall. One was a draft horse, Cross. The doorway was actually small enough. He touched both sides going through. My thoroughbred mare took me two hours to corral. The last time she got out, much to my frustration, she was an awesome jumper. So a stranger rounding them up and putting them into a tiny yard was mind-blowing. I've had horses since I was nine. I'm 32 now. I've had ponies and horses. I've had a Palooza's, Arabians, draft horses, quarter horses, walking horses, saddlebreds, thoroughbreds, mustangs, foals, geldings, mares, and geldings that still thought they were stallions. I've had a lot of horses from all walks of life. I will tell you, they consistently do not like to be crammed into tight spaces, especially not in a group. I had two severely abused horses. I was rehabbing a thoroughbred that actually had PTSD and a racking horse that actually took me three years to touch without some sort of a bad reaction. They did not like being in stalls and all but one were mares. Mares are extremely moody and two of mine were particularly vicious to those they didn't like. My walker mare only liked three other horses. She should have been kicking the crap out of the others there. Mine also didn't like to be under lights when they escaped. They avoided them like the plague. And not eating grass, that was over ankle deep. That was unheard of. They were silent and dead still. My neighbor came out and told me that they were like that when he found them. He asked me if I needed help, but I said no. My thoroughbred and racking horse mares did not like men. I told him I'd take them out, one at a time. I took one halter and lead and threw the rest outside the gate. I put the halter on my gelding and opened the gate to lead him out. They had other plans, though. All six came out as a freaking unit. They were literally chest to butt crammed together. My gelding and my Welsh mare had their chest pushing against me as we walked back to the brown barn. Normally, they did not do this. I wouldn't usually allow such bad behavior. We were on the main road, which I did not like. The speed limit is only 35, but people go 60. So I tried to lead them through the large pasture gate. They wouldn't even go on that side of the road, though. I was a little unnerved by their behavior. So I lead them down to the brown barn, and they went in. They were skittish, though, picking at the hay I threw out, walking around restlessly, sticking to the barn like glue, and eyeing the upper pasture. I rationalize it by thinking it's the appy flipping out. That's unnerving them. And why hadn't she come down yet? She had to have seen us all walk down. I rushed to the gate between the little and big pastures out of habit. I didn't want the herd to go back out into the big pasture. I didn't have to worry. They didn't follow me like they usually did. The gate was wide open, but the appy was still running and squealing back and forth in the same area. I started to go get her. Now the neighbor's security lights didn't really light up my pasture. The road was higher than my pasture, so it was cast in a shadow. I could make out her shape in some detail, though. She took off at a panic gallop, swerved sideways, and jumped the stream. When she landed, she nearly landed on her face. She caught herself, though, and took off at a dead gallop again. I ducked behind a stump. If she would have hit me, I would have been dead. I went back and chained the gate. I decided to forego looking her over until I got the halters and leads. She was too hot at the moment. I decided to walk on the road instead of through the pasture again. The pasture was uneven, unlit, and full of springs. Sometime during this, clouds had taken over the sky, so there was no moonlight to see by. 
The spot on the road where I was at was paved and pretty well lit, though my neighbor was paranoid as mentioned. I had almost gotten to the white barn when I got this sudden urge to stop and look at a very specific spot in the pasture. I would like to say it was instinct that told me to look, but usually I'd scan the woods first to see what was watching me. That's usually where the watchers are. Instead, I just flicked on my flashlight right on a certain spot. It was extremely close to where the mare was flipping out. I saw red eyes shine. My first thought was, why in the world would a deer be there with all that chaos? I was feeling a sense of extreme dread and didn't know why. Besides, it being where my horse was going nuts told me something else just wasn't right. I then realized where the eyes were relative to the walnut trees in my racing barrels. See, the road is above the pasture and the walnut trees were right at the same elevation as the road. The pasture itself is sloped to deal with the runoff from the road. The barrel it was next to was on the low end of the incline. The barrels were white so I could see a dim lighting from my flashlight on the one it was next to. This thing was too freaking big to be a deer. I was frozen standing there watching it. I just had this feeling it was evil and that I had to keep track of those eyes. It was watching me. It slowly blinked a few times. It also looked over into the woods above the pasture. I know you ask your guests if they ever feel there are other ones out there. Well, let me tell you, it crossed my mind. With a sinking stomach, I flashed my flashlight over the woods to see if I would catch eye shine. I didn't see any, though. So, I went right back to the eyes. They were still there. I flicked back and forth, making sure nothing was sneaking up on me. I don't know how long I stood there watching, frozen. Someone could have come around the bend and hit me with their car. I was so focused. Finally, it started to move off. It glanced at me sideways a few times, I one eye. I think it went into the copse of trees around the creek. I heard nothing. That wasn't surprising, though. The horses were still restless and making noises. I stood there a long time after, looking for eye shine. I was wondering if it could have been a bear. I didn't think so, though. The eyes were consistent in height until it disappeared. Bears are clumsy on their back legs. On this uneven, inclined ground, I have no doubt a bear would have dropped to the ground to go on all fours. Even the rear up and drop down behavior bears do when they're trying to see something wouldn't work. We had one cross our pasture before. He made a lot of noise going through the woods. The horses settled down quicker with a bear. I was almost to my neighbors at this point. I considered leaving the couple hundred dollars of tack at his house. Altars and leads aren't cheap. I had no doubt if I left them there, they'd be gone in the morning. My mother would be pissed. So I darted over, grabbed them, and ran like a bat out of hell. I know, I know. I should have left the tech. I also know you're not supposed to run. But I couldn't even conceive what I'd just seen. I got into the barn, threw the tech down, and hung with the horses. I wasn't going to go back up that pitch black driveway on foot. I figured with the horses I'd have a warning and the barn had plenty of sharp things. I didn't go back up until dawn. I was frozen stiff by that time. I've had years to think this over. It unnerves the crap out of me. How long was that thing there? Was that what was keeping the appy mare from coming down? Was it right there, in the shadows? while I was trying to catch her, or was it in the unlit barn? I walked through to get to the road. Was it the reason the epi swerved and nearly fell? How did my horses get out? I never did find how they got out. Did they panic and jump the fence? I did check the fence line, away from the woods. I did look for tracks around the barrel. Sadly, the ground was hard from frost that morning. But I will say the epi mare was running for a good while. The ground was severely torn up and turned into a muddy mess. It was high noon when I went down there to check, and the ground had melted. I'll bet it was her that woke the neighbor up. It took them about a week to fully settle. 
I don't know if whatever it was was still in the area or if they were that traumatized. It wasn't too long after that my mother filed for divorce. My ex-stepfather got the farm and I moved in with her in the city. Even with all of the weird crap going on there, there were non-bipedal things going on too. I miss it terribly. Maybe it's more accurate to say I miss the farm life rather than the actual place. I'd love to get back onto a farm again, but I'd probably hesitate to move back there. I never told anyone about the eye shine event. I didn't see the actual creature and really how do you convey that unnatural or horror inducing feeling. You saw eye shine, whoop dee do. My mother would have given me the benefit of the doubt, but my mother often told family members things. They made my life enough of a living hell. I didn't want to give them more ammo. I live near London, United Kingdom in Surrey. I once had a neighbor who had been a convicted bank robber. He'd spent a lot of time in prison over the years. Often in high security jails, he was forced to wear what were known as patches, which meant high visibility clothing to try and prevent escape. He told me this story one night, and it's always stayed with me. During one of his many incarcerations spent at Her Majesty's pleasure in the 1970s, his cellmate was a practicing Satanist. They got to talking about his beliefs one night, and the Satanist said he wanted to show my neighbor something. He said, I'm going to raise something from the other side, but don't stare at it. Stay still, take a look for a second or two, then look away. He drew something in chalk on the cell floor chanted something and built a small fire with a few matches. My friend said he saw a small figure composed of the smoke manifest from the fire, move around the floor for a few seconds, as if it had weight or mass. Then it dissipates. It totally freaked him out, and he wasn't a man that would scare easily. He said he trod carefully around his cellmate from then on, and was quite relieved when his sentence came to an end. Back in 1992, we lived near Palm Springs, California. At the time, our kids were in karate classes. Their instructor and I would converse now and then. I told him about my beliefs in the paranormal and UFOs. One evening, he said, Man, you should meet my brother. You and him would get along great, and he could tell you some stuff, too. So his brother and I talked on the phone. But he was hesitant to talk much on the phone, but said he'd be happy to meet in person at his brother's house. As it ended up, he was a retired military service veteran who was stationed at the infamous Groom Lake. As his story goes, one night at the tavern, one of his co-workers lost it. He started rambling on about aliens, vehicles, and technology being applied. He tried to hush his partner up, and before he knew it, the senior level MP and man in black came in and escorted his partner out. That was the last time he ever saw him again. So let's just say this. It's all really going down, man. I have no reason to doubt the instructor's brother, especially because of the way we met. My girlfriend's father-in-law told me a story. He was roofing a house on Vancouver Island near a fish hatchery on the Cowichan River. He was with some native guys. Every night before dark, they would leave early. They didn't want to be around when Sasquatch came to fish in the river. It will chuck rocks at you. He knew a native woman on the island who was willing to share her stories from her youth and her tribe. She said the tribe has a secret society of women singers. Part of the initiation ritual is for the new singer to go into the long house and fast for a spirit vision. This is done to learn what animal will be your sacred spirit for your singing. She was starving and crying because of her hunger. Then she heard something jump down onto the roof of the longhouse. She heard it walk along the smoke hole. She looked up and a Sasquatch was looking down at her. It then lowered a freshly killed deer down through the smoke hole, dropped it by the fire and left. So her spirit became the Sasquatch. 
The native woman, who I will not name nor her tribe, lived along the Semanus River as a child. She remembers the Sasquatch would run beside their house and bang on with its hand, scaring everyone. Her uncle also saw one on the Nanaimo River. She thinks they come down out of the mountains when the water runs low up there in late summer and also to fish when the runs are going on. She says her sister now hears them in her yard at night. They bang on the ground and make this big pounding noise. This all started after her tribe was given permission to begin logging on their land. Last year, my girlfriend and I were camping at Sasquatch Provincial Park, and on the first night, about 3 a.m., I got up to relieve myself. I got back in the tent, and I heard a distinct two-tone call way off in the distance, followed by answering calls of at least two more. One was mid-distance, and one on the mountain right above our campsite. This went on for 40 minutes. We declared a no-phones camp out, so I was not carrying any equipment. I woke my girlfriend, and we listened to it. It was like they were letting each other know they were there. I jokingly called it a Sasquatch roll call. We later listened to tons of wildlife calls, and the only thing that matched was from John Binder Nagel's investigation of mysterious calls in a native community up Vancouver Island. The kids in the campsite beside us started mimicking it. I got up, banged on a tree with a stick, and it stopped. My native friend told me you got the knuck wrong. I've heard from other natives that tree banging is a bad idea as it's a territorial signal, so I may not do that anymore. It sounds legit to me. I commute for my job. It's a retail job, but I live in a rural area in the Southern California foothills, and it is currently my only option. I drive home every night near 1 a.m. I take the highway. It's always deserted at these times, and some nights were more peculiar than others, but nothing so extreme as this incident. It's not uncommon for me to see a lot of wildlife on these drives. I would just take it slow and be alert. Occasionally, I'd see a black-tailed deer, coyotes, raccoons, etc. One recent night, I was only about ten minutes away from home. I rode up to the usual four-way stop that I'd stopped at hundreds of times before. Not a soul around. As I came to a complete stop, I saw something standing just off the side of the road across from the intersection. It was obviously an animal, and it was headed toward the road, so I was going to wait for it to cross. It took me a second to really comprehend what it was at first. I thought it was a horse which, although dangerous, wouldn't be that uncommon for where I live due to irresponsible ranchers and their constantly broken fences. Then, as I started to be able to make out more of what it was as it neared the light from my headlights, I realized something was very wrong with this animal. It was tall, so much so that the legs looked stilt-like. As I sat there, shocked it slowly, stepped into the road, and came across my car's direct beam of my headlight. At this point, I realized two things. One, it was much taller than my car. Its height was monstrous. Two, its gait was very odd, almost like it didn't know how to properly walk as a deer should. It was like all of its joints wanted to bend the wrong way. It moved slowly into the oncoming lane and then swiveled its head to look back at me. All of the hair on my body rose. What spooked me the most was that this was certainly a deer or at least something that looked like one. It looked normal in every way except the spider-like legs it was standing on. At this point, I guessed it, and then the deer stood unmoving as my car sped past by. I looked back in my rearview mirror and caught a glimpse of it crossing the oncoming lane back into the shoulder of the highway, illuminated red by my brake lights. When I got home, I ran into my house and locked myself in. I'm still understandably freaked out. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.